Welcome to the history of electrostatics. If you ask people who discovered electricity, they will tell you names like Benjamin Franklin, that's the dude that flew his kite in a lightning storm, or Thomas Edison, the man that created the light bulb, or Alessandro Volta, the creator of the first battery. But these people had nothing to do with the discovery of electricity. Electricity was first mentioned in the works of a Greek scientist named Tales of Miletus in about 600 BC. Tales noticed that if amber, which is a hardened tree sap, was rubbed it had the ability to pick up dust and leaves. What he was seeing is what we now call static electricity. Another Greek named Theophratus noticed in 300 BC that other substances had static electricity if they were rubbed. Unfortunately, neither Tails nor Theophratus had any explanation, scientific explanation for it. They just thought it was interesting. What they did realize was that sometimes the two objects that are charged would attract each other, and sometimes two charged objects would repel each other. This developed an idea that there were two kinds of charge. Today, we call the one positive and the other one we call negative. We say that like charges repel and unlike charges attract. In 1600 AD an Englishman named William Gilbert started studying these phenomena. He wanted to come up with a good scientific explanation for these ancient discoveries. He was actually the first person to use the word electric which is a variation of the Greek name for amber. Although he had only some success in describing electricity, he was able to show that there were differences between magnetism and electricity that seemed to indicate that they were completely different things. For example, an amber rod has to be rubbed to have electric effects, but a magnet is always a magnet. It doesn't need to be rubbed. Up until this point, scientists all believed that electricity and magnetism were just different versions of the same thing. Then came Benjamin Franklin, 1706 to 1790, and he started his investigations after Gilbert. Yes, he did fly a kite on an overcast day. No actual lightning, but he wasn't the first person to do it. Several people had tried to do it before him to prove that lightning was electrical, but they'd all been killed. Most people thought that he was a nut to do it. But in fact, he had his son set up most of his equipment while he stood back. Franklin was able to prove that lightning was a discharge of static electricity. But this doesn't mean he discovered electricity. Most of Franklin's research actually focused on amber rods and glass rods. It had been found that if a rubbed amber rod was dangling from a string and another rubbed amber rod was brought near, the dangling one would move away. If a dangling rubbed glass rod was brought near to a rubbed glass rod, the dangling one would move away. But if a amber rod, which was rubbed, was brought close to a dangling glass rod, which was rubbed, the glass rod is attracted towards the amber rod. Therefore, the charge in the glass must be different from the charge in the amber. Franklin decided to say that the glass rod had a positive charge and that the amber rod had a negative charge. We use ebonite today in place of amber. Why did he choose glass as positive and amber as negative? Well, no new real reason. He, they were just different and opposite to each other and so he picked one to be positive and the other one to be negative. He then came up with the fluid theory that said that all uh, substances in the universe contained this electric fluid. And this electric fluid was positive and a uh, positively charged object had more of this fluid and a negatively ob charged object had less of this fluid. Now though Franklin's single fluid theory is not exactly right, it did lead him to a law which we still use today in physics. Conservation of charge. Charge cannot be created or destroyed but it can be separated in an object or be transferred from one object to another. Sometimes 
In the past 100 years, it has become clear that these charges depend on the makeup of the atom itself, not on some fluid. The nucleus is made up of protons, which are positive, and neutrons, which are neutral. And they are surrounded by a sea of electrons, which are negative, in orbit. In a normal state, the electrons and protons they balance out, and so the charge on the atom is neutral. In our example here, we've got six positive protons and six neutrons, which are neutral, inside the nucleus. Then we've got six negative electrons in orbit around. Therefore, the carbon atom is neutral. Sometimes the atom may lose or gain electrons. Nothing happens to the stable nucleus made up of protons and neutrons. It is the electrons that are being stripped off or added on because they are on the far outside edge of the atom. If the atom loses electrons, it will have a positive charge. If it gains electrons, it will have a negative charge. Either way, it's now called a 9. Let's have a look at this example. The sodium atom has 11 protons and 11 electrons. Sodium has a tendency to lose one electron. That means it's got 11 protons and 10 electrons. The net charge is a positive 1, making the sodium cation. Chlorine has 17 protons and 17 electrons. It tends to gain electrons. Chlorine gains 1 electron, will have 18 electrons and 17 protons. The net charge is a minus 1 and that's the chloride and iron.